Good morning, everyone. Just going to give a couple more minutes for more people to join, and then we'll get started shortly. All right, let's get started. So hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. My name is Dylan Brether and I'm a scientific sales executive at Rapid Novor. Uh, today we'll be diving into the topic of next generation vaccine development and how the power of proteomics can be leveraged within the field. So I'd like to start by briefly going over the agenda. Uh, we're gonna begin with a great guest presentation that will provide background information on the influenza virus, uh, introduce the next generation of influenza vaccines. The talk will then dive deeper into the concept of the next generation of universal vaccines against influenza and how they can be developed by dissecting the antibody response to a broadly reactive antigen. We'll follow that up with an introduction to protein sequencing and other proteomics techniques highlighting how they can further aid in the development of these next generation vaccines and expand the reach to additional targets of interest as well. Oops. So now I wanna introduce our featured speaker. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Giuseppe Sauto presenting today. Uh, Giuseppe is an assistant research scientist at the Center for Vaccines and Immunology at the University of Georgia. His research activity is focused on the selection, cloning, characterization, and engineering of monoclonal antibodies directed against infectious agents. Uh, in particular, the potential of monoclonal antibodies as therapeutic molecules uh, able to either directly neutralize infectious pathogens or as indirect molecules to be exploited for the development of prophylactic approaches. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Giuseppe. Hello everybody. My name is uh, Giuseppe Sauto and I'm an assistant research scientist in the Center for Vaccine and Immunology at the University of Georgia. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for the organizers for inviting me to, to talk about one of the main, my main projects, which is focused on the dissection of the human antibody response to the influenza virus cobra hemagglutinin. Uh, main topics of my talk today, uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of introduction on influenza virus and next generation influenza vaccines. And then the second part is gonna be about the the core of the project, which is the, which is the dissection of the antibody response to the influenza virus cobra hemagglutinin of influenza. Uh, influenza virus, uh, it belongs to the family Orthomyxoviridae. It has a segmented single strand RNA uh, of a negative sense, and it's an envelope virus in which we have on the envelope two main surface glycoproteins. One is the hemagglutinin and the other one is the neuraminidase. And these two proteins are the main target of neutralizing antibodies. The main cell receptor of the virus is the sialic acid. As I said, uh, hemagglutinin one is uh, one of the most abundant surface like proteins. We have about 500 HA molecules on the, on the virus surface. And as I said, it's also the main target of the antibody response. Uh, as far as uh, the structural point of view of the protein, 
uh, HA is a nomotrimer in which we have three identical monomers. And uh, each monomer is composed by a head region, which is the most variable region, and it contains the receptor binding domain. And it's also responsible of a phenomenon called amalglutination, which is the capability of agglutinate uh, red blood cells. And then we have a stem region, which is more conserved, and it contains the fusion peptide, which allows the virus to fuse with the cell uh, membrane. As far as uh, current underdevelopment in universal influenza vaccines, there are different strategies that have been adopted uh, uh, so far. Uh, the most famous ones are uh, HA stem-based approaches in, we, in which we basically exploit the conservative nature of the, of the stem region to develop uh, universal influenza vaccines. And then there are also other approaches uh, like uh, multiple peptide-based approaches that basically um, in which we have a formulation of a vaccine that is composed by multiple proteins like hemagglutinin, the nucleoprotein, and the matrix proteins. So we have also the uh, elicitation of not only an antibody response, but also a T cell response. Um, and then we, in our lab, we are mainly focused on the development of COBRA-based vac vaccines. Uh, what is a COBRA? It's, it stands for computationally optimized broad re reactive antigen. And more in detail, what this uh, means is basically that we uh, cluster uh, influenza virus based, based on a subtype, for example, H1N1, H3N2, H5N1. So for each one, we can, we can uh, build a phylogenetic tree in order to cluster the different viruses and then build different consensus uh, sequences, like a primary consensus that then we uh, align again together and we can build a secondary consensus sequence, and then we get to a final consensus sequence, which basically recapitulate the diversity of all the different clusters. So it's, in one word, it's a basically a multi-layer consensus-based approach. And this is a schematic of one of our uh, COBRA uh, candidates, for example, for H1N1, uh, in, which is called P1, and in which we basically uh, design these to have different sequences, not only from human sequences, but also from swine sequences. And for example, for P1, we have sequence from a, a human or origin that covered the 1933-1957 and 2009-2011 uh, time frame. And then we have swine sequence that goes from 1931 to 1998. And why it's important to include also swine sequences, because as we know, we have a constant exchange of strains between the swine population and the human population, also because this wine represents a melting pot, basically, of um, also avian strains, since they can be infected not only from humans, but also from uh, av avian viruses. And when we uh, design our COBRA vaccines, and this is an example uh, in which I show you the results we obtain with when we immunize, for example, mice with the COBRA P1, we obtain this very broad antibody response, which is represented by these bars and also by these uh, dots uh, in white, which basically represent not only the binding activity of the antibodies that we elicit for the immunization with COBRAs, but also the hemagglutination inhibition activity, which is basically a reflection of the neutralizing potential of the antibodies. While when we immunize with the current vaccine strain or uh, an historical vaccine strain like uh, California 09, we have pretty much always this same answer in which we have a pretty homologous response against uh, the, the, the strain that we use for the immunization. And importantly, we get the same answer, so the same breadth of response also when we change the vaccine platform. So for example, we obtain very similar results in terms of breadth when we uh, use virus-like particles for immunization, when we use live, live viruses, uh, antigen ferritin nanoparticles, split vaccines, recombinant proteins, uh, and recently also by using uh, mRNA uh, platforms, platforms and uh, recombinant uh, adenoviruses. In terms of the antibody response, 
when we immunize mice, for example, with our Cobra P1 antigens, and we use as a comparator uh, wild-time vaccine strains, we also get, in terms of antibody secreting cells uh, from the spleen, this very broadly reactive profile, which is basically represented by these uh, pie charts on the right, which summarize what we obtain, and it's represented in these uh, graphs you know, on the left. And so again, when we immunize with cobras, we get a very broad response with antibody secreting cells that recognize multiple strains. And uh, when we immunize with the wild type strains, we obtain a pretty homologous response. So in this case, when, for example, we immunize with a California 9 strain, we get a California 9 uh, specific antibody response. So in order to better understand what's what are the specificities of these antibodies and what the peculiarities of these antibodies in terms of not only of binding activities, but also in terms of uh, neutralizing potential. We basically generated um, monoclonal antibodies. So we immunized mice, for example, with uh, our Cobra uh, P1 uh, antigen, and then we obtained uh, uh, an antibody response. And what we did is to uh, take the splints from these uh, mice and generate uh, hybridoma cell lines in order to following obtain also monoclonal antibodies and characterize them. And this is a representation of the Cobra P1 specific monoclonal antibodies that we obtain. And here I represent you their amagglutination inhibition activity, which, as I say, represent the potential of the antibodies to neutralize the different viruses. So on the on the on the horizontal part of this table, we have the different strains for H1 and 1. And then on the left, vertically, we have all the different monoclonal antibodies. And as you can see, we have different specificities of antibodies. So we have some of them that are pandemic HAI positive monoclonal antibodies. So they have hemagglutination inhibition activity against only pandemic strains and also post pandemic strains, like the Spanish flu of. Uh, 1918, and also the California 9, and also their post-pandemic uh, strains. And then we have also these uh, broadly uh, HAI-positive monoclonal antibodies. So in this case, this interesting antibody is able to recognize multiple strains and there's neutralizing activity against the majority of them. And then we have also, of course, HAI-negative antibodies and these are most likely recognizing the stem region of the of the of the hemagglutinin because uh, that's not responsible of causing the agglutination of red blood cells. While when we use uh, wild type strains, uh, we have uh, a more restricted repertoire of of antibodies. We have again. Uh, antibodies that are able to recognize pandemic or post-pandemic strains, and they have amagglutination inhibition activity against these strains. And then when we immunize with seasonal uh, antibodies, we have these antibodies that are only HAI positive. They have hemagglutination inhibition activity only against these seasonal strains. But we don't have any of those antibodies that have a very broadly reactive profile like we had with the COBRA uh, antigens. And then since we use, as you remember, we use also swine strains uh, for designing uh, our Cobra P1, we also characterize if they have any HAI activity, any amalgamation inhibition activity against swine strains. And this is the case since, as you can see from this table, again, in the horizontally, we have all the swine strains and in here we have some representative maps from uh, P1. The majority of them, they have hemagglutination inhibition activity also against swine strains, meaning that they can potentially uh, protect against these, these strains. And also we wanted to test against uh, how our antibodies against most recent uh, and possible pandemic um, strains that are circulating in the swine population. So this is a work that has been published in 2020. And there is this H1N1 swine strains that has been showing to have the capability also to infect humans. And so we wanted to see if our COBRA immunization and the antibodies that they are elicited can, can be able to uh, have a neutralization potential, not only a binding activity, as we can see from this graph, but also an HAI activity, meaning a neutralizing potential against uh, these strains. And this is the case, as you can see from, 
from from this graph since they have the, at the polyclonal level we do see uh, a neutralizing activity and and then we went further and tested also the monoclonal antibodies as you can see also the corresponding monoclonal antibodies from p1 are able to uh, have hem agglutination inhibition activity against against these strains Uh, so, since this is uh, this is a preliminary evaluation at the preclinical level of the uh, potential of Cobra antigens to uh, elicit an antibody response and a broad antibody response in a, in a in a mouse model, we wanted to see also what is the potential of antibodies that are able to recognize Cobra antigens and that, that already exist in the human population, because as we know, the majority of, of, uh, of humans are, have been already uh, infected with influenza, especially if we are considered adults, and uh, they have been vaccinated, uh, most of them. And so they have a pre-immunity to influenza. And we want to see if these uh, antibodies that have been generated from previous vaccinations or infection are able to recognize cobras and this dissect this antibody response against cobra antigens. So the goal of this project is to go further and trying to determine the antibody pre-immunity to cobra in order to uh, dictate also improvements for cobra designs uh, and also as a preclinical assessment and the validation of their efficacy because eventually uh, cobra antigen will be used in, uh, in clinical trials uh, to see uh, to see what's their potential in the, in, the, in the human vaccination. So the overarching hypothesis of this work is that antibodies in the repertoire of vaccinated individuals are capable of recognizing COBRA HAs, are endowed with, are endowed with a broad uh, binding and functional activity and may be elicited upon immunization with, the, with COBRA antigens. And this is also a study that can represent a proof of concept and a methodological study for uh, upcoming repertoire studies on co during our COBRA vaccine uh, human trials. And so this is a, uh, a schematic of our pipeline for uh, determining this uh, COBRA uh, pre-immunity in humans. And so we have uh, a core of patients that have been previously immunized with the uh, the current standard of care influenza vaccine. And, and, and then we uh, collected blood, for example, at day zero, day seven, to evaluate the, the plasma blast response, for example, and then the day 21 uh, samples for uh, the B memory cells evaluation. And we initially uh, evaluated the polyclonal response. So we took the serum from these individuals and run them for ELISAs against a panel of recombinant uh, hemagglutinins, and then we use also the PBNC for uh, the repertoire sequencing of the BCRs of the B cell receptors, and then we obtain a panel of monoclonal antibodies in order to dissect this antibody response. And this is a representation of, for example, of the uh, polyclonal uh, C evaluation in terms of uh, binding and also in terms of HAI activity. So we categorize, for example, our cohort uh, based on the age. So we have young individuals, middle-aged individuals, and then elderly. And as you can see, uh, um, which is very evident, uh, we have that the young population have a, a more broad response, have a more um, effective response in terms of, this is the representation of the HAI activity, so the neutralization potential of the antibodies. And on the x-axis, we have, for example, different strains for H3 and 2, influenza B, and H1 and 1. And as you can see, we have all these uh, peaks that represent uh, the presence of an agglutination inhibition activity against different strains. But why, when we go further with age, for example, in middle-aged individuals, and also with, especially with the elderly, we have that these uh, neutralization potentials uh, uh, wane and um, uh, decays uh, with the age. Uh, and this has been observed not only by our group, but also by other groups. Uh, and it's a phenomenon associated with the, with the aging of, individu of the individuals. And this is a representation of our gating strategy for uh, selecting antigen-specific 
memory B cells. Uh, for example, and here we go uh, for memory uh, B cells, and we select those that are antigen specific, for example, for H1 and H3. And then we sort these antigen specific cells and we obtain um, uh, different uh, sequences of which represent the repertoire of these individuals. And we uh, analyze their, um, for example, for example, heavy, uh, heavy chain subfamily representation uh, in terms of, for example, H1 and H3 and H1, H3 uh, reactive uh, B cell receptors. And how we did that in order to, since we have uh, a court of, uh, of numerous in indiv individuals in order to try to uh, compile these experiments, what we did is to use these uh, barcoded antibodies, which have uh, a nucleotide, a specific nucleotide sequence on their uh, FC uh, region, which is covalently bound to, to this FC region. And they recognize uh, a pan um, antigen on the cells of uh, B, on the, on the surface of the B cells. And so what we can do is to, for example, if we have multiple individuals, we can barcode each one of them and then we can pull all these samples together since they have been barcoded and we can of course stain them for uh, for markers of b cells and then analyze uh, after the sorting uh, their b cell receptor repertoire and this is again a, a representation of our gating strategy so we go with singlets and then we uh, select for cd19 positive of course they're going to be also cd Three and CD14 uh, uh, negative. And then we select for the CD27 uh, memory B cells uh, for class which in particular, because we are interested in those that uh, are, for example, IgG uh, positive. And in here we have uh, our gating strategies for the antigen specific. So we use basically recombinant hemagglutinin that they have, uh, they are conjugated with a, with a fluorochrome, uh, for example, APC and PE. And we can select so those cells that have BCR receptors that are reactive against, for example, H3 and H1, or we can also select those that are double positive. And then once we have sorted these cells, we uh, use a 10x chromium uh, genomics-based approach in order to single cell sort, single cell sequencing these cells, and uh, through next generation sequencing. And this is a representation. Uh, of what we obtained following the, the sequencing and the analysis of the BCFB, B cell receptor uh, repertoire. So in here we have, for example, the different donors, uh, and here we have all the subfamily genes for H1, for H3, and for H1, H3. So we have a two-dimensional two uh, information. So we have not only the donor information of the, of the um, for example, the sequence subfamily, and, but we have also the antigen specificity of each of these uh, antibodies and this um, repertoire sequencing. And as you can see, and as expected, we get uh, a representation of uh, subfamilies that have been previously described would be expanded following influenza vaccination on infection. One of them is, for example, the WH169, and then we have also other uh, well-represented subfamilies like the WH 323 and the WH 439. And the same also uh, type of analysis, we perform this also for uh, uh, light chains. And also in this case, we have a pretty good representation of previously described uh, antibody genes, uh, light chain genes, uh, like uh, the 315 kappa and 320 kappa uh, uh, subfamily genes. And once we have uh, conducted this preliminary analysis, uh, what we do is to uh, select uh, antibodies that have uh, specifically expanded and that they show a, a, a particular uh, reactivity profile in terms of uh, binding to antigens. And we recombinantly, uh, we clone them in an expression back and then we recombinantly express them uh, through our um, uh, mammalian expression system, the XP293. And so in here we have a representation of our panel of monoclonal antibodies against, for example, H1, H3, and influenza B. 
And so we have cloned these antibodies and we have uh, characterized uh, their um, gene profile in terms of subfamily and also in terms, for example, CDR3 and uh, CDR all three uh, length and sequence uh, in order to, to see if we have a differentiation of the different uh, clonotypes you obtain and also in order to assess the, um, the germline in the identity. So if we have uh, the presence of uh, a well-defined uh, somatic hypermutation. And we are, in here, we have a preliminary evaluation of the binding activity against, for example, representative HA, um, HA uh, glycoproteins. And as I say, we use this very uh, good system for uh, the production of uh, recombinant proteins. So we use this system not only for the production of recombinant HAs uh, using this uh, uh, mammalian cell line uh, system, which is based on XP23 cells, which have the capability of grow in suspension. And also with these cells, we can also generate stable cell lines. So we are able to continuously propagate these cells and continuously produce uh, proteins. And we uh, easily adapted this system also to the production of um, recombinant monoclonal antibodies. And in, in here, we have an overview of the functional and binding activity of our monoclonal antibodies. So for example, this is a representation of the H1N1 uh, monoclonal antibodies. And here we have again, all the strains, in this case for H1, we have also tested against H5. And in green, when we see green, it means that these antibodies bind, while it's red, they don't bind the, the corresponding proteins. And as you can see, we have different, uh, uh, different specific antibodies. Uh, in, the, in the bottom table, we have the HAI activity. And so we have, for example, STEM-directed uh, antibodies. So they are very broad in terms of binding, but they don't have any HAI uh, activity, as you can see from this table. And then we have these interesting antibodies that they have uh, a broad profile in, in terms of, of binding, but this uh, broad profile in terms of binding is also reflected in an hemagglutination inhibition activity against different strains. And interestingly, some of these antibodies also recognize our COBRA antigens, meaning that they can be potentially uh, be recalled when we immunize these individuals with, uh, uh, with our COBRA antigens. So these uh, interesting antibodies can be potentially uh, recalled and have this uh, highly uh, broadly reactive profile against different uh, influenza strains. And this is a representation, similar representation for our group two, uh, H3 and two uh, specific uh, monoclonal antibodies. Also in this case, we have uh, broadly uh, reactive antibodies and we have not only in terms of binding models in terms of HAI activity and interestingly, they also recognize our COBRA antigens. And then we wanted to further um, assess what regions they, these antibody bind. And so we, we started to characterize the binding profile in terms of competition assays. Uh, since we have our panel of P1, COBRA P1 specific antibodies, we use these antibodies as a way to characterize the binding profile of our human antibodies. And as you can see, there are some of our, our human antibodies in the panel that are uh, able to compete with COBRA P1 specific antibodies. And this, interestingly, these antibodies in gray, they have an HAI activity and they have um, also a broad HAI activity like 1FA. And then we have another group that are stem binders. So we have also a panel of stem specific antibodies and they, interestingly, they compete with previously described uh, stem directed antibodies and also with stem-directed antibodies present in our panel. And in order to uh, go more in depth with the epitope mapping, we are conducting some uh, cryo-electron microscopy experiments in collaboration with the uh, Musa lab here in the CDI. And so we are performing some cryo-EM experiments uh, using our COBRA's uh, recombinant hemagglutinins, 
with uh, our uh, panel of monoclonal antibodies. And this is a human antibody from our panel, uh, 50A, which is an H1 and one specific human monoclonal antibody that is, has a very broad uh, reactive profile in terms not only of binding, but also in terms of uh, HAI activity. And then it also recognize our uh, COBRA antigens. And in this case, we uh, did a cryo EN with our co with another Cobra, Cobra X6, which again, another Cobra, another Cobra candidate for H1N1. And as you can see, recognize the head region as expected because it has an HEI activity and it, it, it recognizes a conserver region. And especially it's interacting with the HA through the CDRH1 and CDRH3 uh, domains of the antibody. So take home message of, of, of this talk is that uh, antibodies recognizing and having a functional activity against uh, current uh, and uh, COBRA uh, uh, HA antigen, antigen exist in the human repertoire. These antibodies are uh, both head and the stem director uh, antibodies. So they are able to bind the head and also the stem. But some of these antibodies have a broad functional profiles, as we have seen also recently with, uh, with the cryo-EM. And they are able to neutralize multiple uh, historical and current uh, vaccine strains. So future step of all this work is that we wanted to assess the prevalence of these uh, COBRA reactive antibodies in the human population, uh, in, the, in, the, in the whole antibody repertoire. And, uh, how this prevalence fluctuates longitudinal, meaning that we have, for example, individuals that have been vaccinated uh, uh, repeatedly in different years, and we want to see how these uh, specific antibodies they fluctuate in, in they fluctuate in terms of prevalence in these different years. Uh, that being said, I want to uh, conclude my presentation by uh, acknowledging and say thank you to all the people that. Uh, collaborated to uh, and allowed to uh, perform all this work, in particular people of the CBI and the of Tedros lab, and also our collaborators at the University of Texas and in Vanderbilt Uni University, they were which they were very instrumental for um, the the BCR repertoire sequencing and uh, antibody sequencing and characterization, um, and of course I also wanted to. Uh, to thank our uh, our funders, uh, NIH and NIAD for, especially for the Civic Consortium, which is a collaborative influenza vaccine innovation centers, which is our main funder for uh, all this work. Thank you. Okay, I just want to uh, say thank you very much to, to Giuseppe for that uh, phenomenal presentation. I'm uh, really happy to have him and his team as clients, and it's, it's great to learn more about uh, what, the, what the team has been working on, and we're really looking forward to continue working with you on, on your future projects. And I think the, the information and ideas presented provide a great entryway into how valuable proteomics can be when not only studying influenza, but really infectious diseases as, as a whole. So Giuseppe utilized a number of different techniques throughout his presentation. Uh, some of them are proteomics based and some not. Um, and this included generating monoclonal antibodies for immunization of model organisms, dissecting the circulating antibody populations in convalescent patients to uncover invaluable insights, and characterizing these antibodies further to better understand the immune response itself. So each of these can play an important role in the research and development of vaccines and therapeutics. And though, they're not, and though it's not the only route, uh, proteomics, proteomics can help with each of these. So specifically here at Rapid Novo, we're able to utilize our unique de novo protein sequencing technology and capabilities to not only sequence monoclonal antibodies, but also to discover unique antibodies via polyclonal sequencing. Uh, and then we can further characterize those um, with where and how they're binding using HDXMS and SPR-based techniques. So though we do now offer 
a wide selection of proteomic services. Really the core of Rapid Novor is our in-house bioinformatics team, our expertise in mass spec-based proteomics, and our proprietary technology. So the first technology that we launched was actually our Remap technology, which we regularly use to sequence monoclonal antibodies. So the workflow for this involves taking a purified protein, doing a number of digestions uh, with a number of different enzymes, flying that on a mass spec, and then having our, our algorithms put together a preliminary sequence before our bioinformatics team does a check and double check of the sequence. So now you may be wondering what sets us apart from others that are offering de novo protein sequencing. Um, and to start, really, we have industry leading standards for quality and coverage. So we require a minimum of 30 times coverage for every amino acid, giving us virtually 100% confidence and 100% accuracy in the sequences we provide. Uh, we also ensure that every sequence undergoes at least two separate independent checks uh, by, our by our bioinformatics team. So outside of these high quality standards, we're also able to differentiate between isobaric residues, leucine and isoleucine using our wild technology. And historically, this was actually a major issue to overcome. Uh, and our team was actually the first to commercialize that method. So if we're gonna tie this back to Giuseppe's earlier presentation, uh, if you already have monoclonal antibodies of interest, you can now determine the amino acid sequence directly from the protein itself. And that sequence data may then be in turn utilized for something such as structure determination or for the strategic engineering of antiviral monoclonal antibodies, SCFDs, and FABs. So, but what if you're looking for unique antibodies to work with or even hoping to assess the circulating antibody populations within convalescent patients such as what Giuseppe had done? So this is where our REPAB polyclonal sequencing and antibody discovery platform comes in. Uh, our workflow for this is somewhat similar to our REMAB workflow, but it's broken up into sort of two different aspects. So the main workflow is our proteomics workflow in which we're able to take antigen affinity purified antibodies. Uh, we then will run the samples through a similar program uh, to our REMAB workflow with some additional steps, such as a preliminary screening step, as well as some chain pairing experiments once the sequencing is actually completed. Uh, and then in addition to that proteomics workflow, we can also run what we call a proteogenomics approach, uh, in which we'll take some PBMCs, perform a bulk NGS run, uh, and then this allows us to overlay some of the proteomics data on top of the NGS to identify some additional antibody sequences that may be of interest. So what are the benefits of, of our approach here? Well, for starters, because we're using a mass spec based approach, uh, we'll generally be pulling out the most abundant antibodies within a polyclonal mixture. And this will provide a more accurate picture of the humoral immune response than other antibody discovery platforms may be able to provide. Um, in addition, because we're actually doing uh, performing antigen affinity purifications, and once we do the sequencing itself, are providing the actual chain pairings, you know that the antibodies provided are going to be good binders of the antigen of interest. So on top of this, uh, the platform itself is actually theoretically species agnostic, which may allow you to use different models for your discovery platforms that you may not have had access to previously. And then further, even if you already have antibody discovery programs underway, our approach is, is unique and really can provide a differentiated subset of antibodies and could actually complement your current efforts. So circling back again to the uh, infectious diseases and how this may apply, uh, this could allow you to exploit the functional native immune response in patients as a means of identifying novel antiviral therapeutics. Um, also allows you to assess the effectiveness of a vaccine to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies, or it could even be used to develop anti-drug antibody assays. So with our monoclonal and polyclonal sequencing, that really covers the core technology that Rapid Novor was founded on. Uh, however, as we've continued growing, we've also expanded and we wanna utilize our proteomics expertise to provide even more value to researchers. So one of the additional services we've begun offering is HDX MS epitope mapping. And as a brief overview, this involves taking the antigen of interest, labeling it with deuterium, quenching at different time points, digesting that, and then flying it on the mass spec to produce a deuterium uptake plot. 
Uh, this is done in both an unbound state uh, as well as when bound to the antibody of interest. And this allows us to look at the differences in uptake. So when the antibody antigen are in the bound state, the area where the antibody is binding will be shielded and there'll be less deuterium uptake at that site. This allows us to infer the location of the epitope for a particular antibody. And some of the benefits of using HDX MS approach is that we require a small amount of sample and we can perform the experiments with a high level of efficiency. Uh, there's also broader application since it can be used for larger proteins, intrinsically disordered proteins, and is able to identify not only linear epitopes, uh, but also conformational epitopes as well. So knowing where an antibody binds can obviously be very important to understanding an antibody's mode of operation, uh, and that, such as how Giuseppe identified whether antibodies were binding to the head or stem of the HA protein structure. And then the final and most recent service that uh, we've begun offering is SPR analysis of antibody antigen pairs. Uh, in this workflow, we take an antibody of interest, we can immobilize it on a gold-coated sensor, we'll flow the antigen over the sensor to initiate binding, uh, before then washing away the antigen and regenerating the surface. Now, this allows us to create a sensogram that can be used to determine the on rate of an antibody, off rate, uh, as well as the overall affinity. So this information can be very helpful when you're looking for specific characteristics within an antibody for different use cases. Uh, so such as the different requirements for say a therapeutic antibody where you know that you want a strong binder versus one that's gonna be used in something such as a diagnostic assay where you may not need quite as strong of binding or possibly even require something that doesn't bind quite as well. So with all these different techniques, uh, just really wanted to highlight how proteomics can help in various stages throughout the research and development of therapeutics and vaccines. So whether that involves validating your actual target uh, using something such as our REMAD technology uh, or HDXMS epitope mapping, or whether you're looking at performing some discovery work, doing some lead isolation with our polyclonal antibody sequencing as well, uh, or maybe you're further down the line and are looking to do some more lead profiling using something such as SPR, or again, doing some epitope mapping there. Uh, and even maybe further, uh, there's lots of areas where we can help in the preclinical and clinical development stages as well. So as a world leaders in, in next generation proteomics and being the first to also deconvolute polyclonal antibodies via proteomics alone, uh, we at Rapid Novor are excited to continue helping advance science and decode immunity to elevate human health. And with that, I just wanted to thank everybody for their time today. I wanted to thank uh, Giuseppe once again for his great presentation. And now I just would like to open the floor to any questions that we might have. I do see we have one question uh, asking if there will be a recording. There will be a recording. So if uh, you want to come back and check anything out, uh, we'll absolutely be able to have, help you with that. It doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in. Um, so with that, just want to thank everybody once again. Um, hope everybody has a great rest of the day. And if you have any questions or anything that you need to learn about proteomics, feel free to reach out.